Welcome to another episode of the Gay Barchive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and our guest today is the owner of the longest continuously operating gay bar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is it. His name is George Snyder, and he'll be telling us about the history of his bar, which has operated since 1968. So welcome to the show, George. Well, good to be with you today, Art. You know, it's pretty thrilling to find out. I mean, the guy's so young, obviously you did not start this bar, but this is it, is the oldest continuously operating bar in Milwaukee, gay bar, and has been there in operation as a gay bar since 1968. Is that correct? That is correct. We've uh, never moved um, obviously, like you said, I'm not the original owner. Um, so beyond, uh, you know, a little bit of change in ownership in the last, uh, be about 10 years ago. Um, yeah, we've never, we've never moved from this spot and we've been a mainstay here, like you said, since 1968. And, um, it's kind of interesting to me because I've researched gay bars all across the country. And in reality, there are not that many gay bars that pre-exist world, the end of World War II. So this bar opening in 1968 was one of the early bars in the grand scheme of things for the gay world. Um, you didn't have a whole ton of bars before the 60s around the country, especially in places like Milwaukee. I mean, maybe New York and San Francisco, you would expect that. But, well, but there, were, there were establishments you know, here in Milwaukee, but uh, you know, as well as I do, um, that uh, a lot of those uh, establishments were very clandestine, um, kind of under the radar. And um, I'm sure you found in your research uh, as well, um, as you go and, 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 you know, experience these stories from different bars across the country, the, the further you go back in history, sometimes there's a, a shady, um, shall we say, uh, mob or organized crime connection, which is how a lot of the establishments pre-Stonewall um, you know, we're able to open and, and function, um, I guess, without being raided by the police or shut down by the police all the time. Absolutely. And that was true all around the country. Um, and I shouldn't even say pre-Stonewall art. I, it, some of that lingered. Uh, a lot of municipalities, a lot of states had, um, you know, sodomy laws, um, you know, decency laws, things like that, that lingered well into the, to the 70s, if not in some cases into the 80s. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there were the cases of police harassment that went even into the late 90s in some places. Um, and probably today, there's probably still some. Oh, now, there's, there's always, there's always going to be that. But, uh, I mean, the good news is that um, as a, a queer community, we're much stronger. We have much, uh, much more representation and a louder voice than, than we had in the past. Now, I know you weren't there at the time, but. This is it. When it opened in 1968, was not a mob-run business. It was not any kind of nefarious operation. It was run by a woman. It was, and a, a, a woman who identified as uh, straight um, at that, which uh, you know I guess goes to speak to her alliance with our community and uh, dedication and love for her friends. Um, and customers in the community. She really stuck her neck out there um, in the late 60s. Now, I'm not familiar with Milwaukee um, on a personal level. I've never been to Wisconsin. So kind of paint a little picture for me. Is the location where you are on Wells, is that in the heart of a downtown business district or is that kind of in the outskirts of town? Where, where is it located? How are you positioned? Well, I mean, we are, I mean, literally, if you look at the history of the city, we are half a block away from uh, Cathedral Square Park, which is a, uh, a grand square where the original courthouse actually for the city was. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, I guess, the geographical center of the city. Um, we also have uh, down the street from us here to the, uh, to the west is City Hall, and that's only about well, two and a half blocks away. So we are in the, in the center of the city. Um, as far as where where we stand with other 
queer establishments in the city. This is not the traditional location for, um, I guess, the gay neighborhood, the gay district, or the gay bar district. That happens to be uh, several, well, about a mile uh, to our south. Um, the uh, prominent intersection there, for those of those of you listening who are familiar with Milwaukee, would be Second and National. Um, so we are. Uh, this is it has always been, and we still are on our own island here. Um, but um, that has, you know, it has its its benefits. It has its, uh, you know, deterrence as well. But uh, yeah, it, whatever we're doing, uh, we, we've been able to stay here for fifty three years now. So that's yeah, pretty amazing. Coming up on fifty four. Coming up very soon. Yep, very soon. Um, now. Bringing back the fact that this is 1968, this is before Stonewall happened. Mm -hmm. So for people who are not doing the math or not paying attention, this bar opened before Stonewall. I did not go to my first gay bar until 10 years after this is it opened. It was in 1978 in Baltimore. And at that time, even 10 years later, many of the bars were hidden they were not in the heart of downtown. They had rear entrances with little to no signage. Mm -hmm. This is it was not that way, was it? Well, um, to a certain extent, no. But um, you, you mentioned something key there about, uh, you know, the rear entrances, you know, secretly, you know, finding a way to get into the establishment for years when we first opened um, because, there was that sensitivity to, you know, oh, I don't want to be seen walking into a, a, a gay bar, a queer establishment. I don't want to be seen going through the front door. For years and years, there was a small passageway um, in, our, in our back alley that led out towards the Cathedral Square Park that I mentioned before. And um, that shut down. I think they put an elevator shaft connecting to our building and the, the building next door in the 90s. But that was a primary point of entry for many, many years. In fact, um, we, we still have, uh, we, we always leave, that sounds silly to say, we always leave the back door open, Art. But we do, um, you know, so we do have, uh, you know, people who love that nostalgic, you know, again, with <laughs> no tongue in cheek entry through the rear. Um, so we do have that part of, I guess, that, history that com comes along with this space just coming from the time you know that we open but um yeah it, it was uh we never had a sign out front there was a small sign you know like one of those beer signs that hang over the the front of of your bar door i think the original one here was an on decker sign maybe uh i think for a while it was a, a paps blue ribbon sign but um yeah for for a while there just because of the the nature of 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 the scene back in the day um there were methods or modes to kind of keep it uh on the dl now did did the original look with well, the original space there did you have windows facing out on the street where the public could look in or was it all closed up only one window and uh i'm sure you've run into this in your research as well um and i don't know how it how it varied from or varies from state to state in the past, but the um, the ordinance here required you to have at least one window. And I think the minimum size, and I could be wrong, so don't quote me on this. I think the minimum size was a 12 by 12 inch window. <laughs> um, the idea being that, uh, you know, a, a police officer walking by on his or her beat could peek into the window and, and look into the bar. So we, for many, many years, just had, it wasn't a 12 by 12 inch window, but it was just a small, maybe a two and a half by two and a half uh, foot window next to our front door. And that was the only window in this space. Otherwise it was a, you know, a dark uh, box. Uh, and uh, you can probably see in the video here with me, there's some natural light coming in. I'm sitting on the side that we expanded into in uh, early 2019. And uh, these would be the first, uh, I guess, major windows uh, daylight that we've been able to have in here in, in the entire history of the bar. But um, there are other establishments too. Uh, famously, um, not to deviate too far from this is it, but uh, to mention another bar um, by name here, Lacage, um, which opened in 1984 in Milwaukee. 
they made waves when they opened because they were the first, uh, you know, gay bar, queer establishment to have giant windows that, uh, you know, opened up uh, on a major intersection, that being the uh, second and national intersection that I spoke of before. And that was a huge, that was a quantum leap. You know, nobody was doing that uh, still up until the 80s. Um, and, you know, I hear stories. We, we I don't think, ever, um, you know, became a victim to any kind of violence or, or hate crimes or damage to property here. But there are stories that I hear from other uh, bars that have been around or those have that, that I knew that have since closed where they would get bricks through the window, um, you know, vandalism, you know, you name it. Um, their signs would go missing. They would rearrange the letters. Uh, anything you can imagine, that happened. So, uh, like I said, that was that was a trend uh, for the bars. You know, you you have the minimum window, uh, I guess, uh, opening as required by law, and uh, it really was a luxury um, up until up until probably the last thirty years, where um, you as a queer bar or gay gay bar um, had large windows that opened up uh, and let some daylight in. Otherwise, very dark and uh, and clandestine, I guess, is is a great word to, to use again. Absolutely. Now, how big, roughly, was the original This Is It space? Do you know? The original space, uh, if you take the, the square footage overall, is probably around 1,200 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of that is taken up, you know, by the bar. So I couldn't give you an exact number on the occupiable square footage. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's essentially, you know, 1,200 square feet. And uh, as I mentioned, when we when we t took over the space that I'm sitting in now, we uh, we doubled our size. So now we we sit at about on the first floor, uh, about 2,400 square feet. And um, when that bar first was operating in the 60s and 70s, um, some of the things I've read about the bar is that it tended to attract an older clientele. Um, was that always the case or did it kind of open as, well, this is the only gay bar in town, everybody goes here and evolved into more of an older men's bar? Well, um, to, I guess to, to address that, yes, the crowd uh, tended to be older. Um, if you go back, however, all the way to the, to the late 60s, early 70s, it was more of a mixed crowd. Um, you know, and we, we, by all means, were not the first, uh, you know, gay bar here in Milwaukee. There was even one um, kind of catty corner to us in a block up called the Seaway Inn, which, which didn't identify 100% as a gay bar, but their clientele um, kind of drove the, I guess, drove the vibe in there. And uh, when they shut down, a lot of that clientele came over here and they tended to be an older clientele in that establishment. So that was the, the foundation, I think, for the original crowd here. But if you look at a lot of the old photos that we have, um, which by the way, we have a lot of them uploaded to our Facebook page. Um, if you look at the photos that we have going back, I think the earliest that we go to is about 1975, 76, somewhere in there, um, through, the, through the mid eighties. Um, it's a very mixed crowd. Um, I think what happened over time is, you know, this is it uh, was not the most popular gay bar. It was it was a mainstay. It was a neighborhood bar. And I think the younger contingent, especially in the late 80s, early 90s, went to some of the newer establishments that opened up, uh, i.e. Lacage that I mentioned before. And um, and uh, those who remained uh, tended to be on the older side of things. Um in fact, uh, when I first started coming here as a customer, um, I'm going to say early 2000s. I won't say exactly what year, but um, it was uh, th it was called the Wrinkle Room. Um, and sometimes uh, you'd hear people say, "Oh, this was it," um, and it, it was largely a commentary on the the median age of our of our customer base. As a customer coming in, as a you know 21 year old maybe slightly younger when I first got in here, um, man, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed being able to sit down and talk with the older crowd and it was comfortable. It was, um, I guess I learned so much from um, the older clientele, some of whom are still coming here uh, to this day. 
And uh, I guess it, it, it even laid the foundation for the conversation you and I are having today, um, where I learned a lot of the history, not just of, of this space, this bar, but the, the scene in Milwaukee over the years and uh, just some of the, the struggles in general. If you look at you know, our, our community, our population overall and the queer community, um, the strides and the struggles that, uh, that we all went through uh, and, and I guess paving the way for, for my generation and later generations to not only take the reins, but to live more openly, honestly, and comfortably. So I always loved having the older crowd here and they're, they're still here, <laughs> even though it's younger now, uh, they're still here. Well, I probably never would have really learned about you and um, so learned so much about This Is It had it not been for two local historians who have made a great effort to document as much of Milwaukee's gay history as possible. And um, of course, you know, both of those people, I'm sure, uh, Don Schwamb, and yep. Michael Takash. Michael is the one who connected me with uh, with you, and their efforts with the, um, the Wisconsin LGBT History Project. Michael's book on Milwaukee LGBT or LGBT Milwaukee, um, the new book that Michael just did with B.J. Daniels on the drag history of Milwaukee. Uh, they've made such an effort at preserving the queer history of a place that could easily have been forgotten because it's not New York, it's not San Francisco, it's not Miami. It was not, you know, um, the hot spot of the universe, but they have done a really good job of documenting your history. And obviously people like you who come in, you know, at a young age, um, decades after the bar opened and find such a connection to it that ultimately you end up being an owner of that very bar. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I, the word that, that comes to mind when you're talking about uh, at least me coming in here, I always, I always appreciated the history, like I said before, and appreciated the, um, you know, the, what this is it represents to this community as being a mainstay. So when, when Joe, my late business partner, asked me to uh, come on board as an owner with him, number one, I was honored because I know a lot of people over the years have tried to uh, either get in on, on an ownership stake or to buy the place from Joe. And he was very, very picky. So I was, of course, honored when, uh, when he asked me to, to join him here. But um, I also knew almost immediately that this wasn't just a means of, of making money, this wasn't just a job, that he was entrusting me to be the, and the word that came to mind was to be the custodian of the history of this bar. And, uh, and he knew because I appreciate, appreciate the history of this place and the, and the history of our community that uh, it'd be left in good hands. I think uh, it would have been a, a tragedy if anyone else would have come in here. And yeah, we've changed some things. I mean, you have to keep things up to date, otherwise they fall apart, you know, update technology, um, especially with like our, our registers and, um, you know, even, even just like, uh, you know, having a, a electronic jukebox that has, um, you know, app capability. But you make those little changes, but I think he knew that I would never come in here clean, clean sweep and change everything. You know, we try to preserve as much of the nostalgia that we can and as much of the history that we can um, so that we don't compromise the, the meaning of this place, the deep meaning of this place. Well, absolutely. And it's just like your great grandmother's recipes. Even if you follow the recipe to the letter, you're probably not going to cook it on a wood burning stove. No, well, <laughs> You're going to step up yeah. to some modern technology. Um, and Absolutely. We, you know, we all kind of expect that. And there are things actually, I think, in the gay bar scene that have improved since, you know, the bars of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, where they're more open, they're more accepting, and they're more able to be part of the community, which they could not be before. And in the Absolutely. 60s, it was really hard for a gay bar to be an active component of the local neighborhood because the local neighborhood didn't want them there, you know, for the most part. Um, 
there were still kind of outcast underground bars that didn't play up their role too much. They kind of hid their head in the sand and said, you know, we're going to operate quietly over here and not cause any trouble. Uh, now you can be as big a part of the community as you want, and and many do. And that is and that is a, a huge paradigm shift. And uh, you know, I don't know how much we want to you know go off on tangents here, but you know that the whole scare in the early two thousands, twenty tens, where um, you know everyone said you know gay bars are going the way of the dodo, as the expression goes. Um, with social media, Grinder in, in particular, everyone said, you know, this is, this is not, uh, you know, gay bars are no longer, no longer have a place. Well, I think, you know, that mentality, yeah, if, if you adopted that mentality and you, and you lived by it, you operated by it, you would have gone the way of the dodo. But uh, as you said, the paradigm shift is that we don't have to hide anymore. We can become involved with our, our, our neighborhood our neighbors, um, our community. And uh, we've done things here at This Is It, especially in the last 10 years, um, that uh, you know, we're, we're not just an institution for our community and a sense of pride for our community, that the fact that we've been here, we're, you know, we're here, we're queer, we're not going anywhere, but also for the general population of Milwaukee. Um, and that was, I guess that's evidenced by um, what just happened this past weekend here, we had a huge French festival, which is not, you know, queer based, but, uh, you know, they invited us to take over their, their main stage right in front of us here and do the first uh, ever drag show that they've had in, in that, in that festival's 39 year history. And the reception, the, the um, response from the community at large, not just our community, but the city of Milwaukee um, was phenomenal. So I think um, you touched on that, where you know you you didn't have that uh, that openness, that interaction, that uh, ability to be part of the community, and that's been the big paradigm shift, at least in the last decade, uh, for for gay bars like us. So let's talk a little bit about you. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> First of all, are you a native? Is that your home? Is Milwaukee your home? This is my home. Um, in fact, uh, I mean, by way of a couple of suburbs, but uh, originally from here. And, uh, you know, there's even, you know, a, a contingent of my family uh, on my mom's side that has been here since uh, I'd be on my great outside of the family since the city's founding. So I'm I'm Milwaukee uh, through and through. Uh, but, yeah, definitely born and raised here. I I had a short stint in Savannah, Georgia, which uh, is, a, is a place Let's put it this way. It's the only other place other than home that is actually felt by home. So that always has a you know place in my heart. But um, I can't shake Milwaukee. I love it here. I feel like uh, it's, it's in my blood. And uh, that contributes to the passion that I have to running this place as well. The, the comparison I've heard from several people who are familiar with both of those locations kind of say that um, Savannah is like the Southern Bell cousin of some of these Midwestern cities like Milwaukee, that it kind of has the same yeah. vibe, but with a Southern twang. Exactly. You know, and, and you know what they always say, there's, uh, there's Midwestern hospitality, there's Southern hospitality. And uh, I think over the years, I've picked out what the little nuances that make them different, but essentially they're, they're the same. You have warm hearted people, um, for the most part, especially especially in the urban centers, you know, a, a, a large degree of acceptance, diversity, and, um, you know, both places, both, uh, I guess, both regions have their own demons. Um, you know, in Milwaukee here, we, we've always had the, um, the very uh, polarizing and, and, I guess, the stigma of being one of the most segregated cities in the country, and, uh, you know, we can point the finger at, uh, you know, what caused that to happen and, uh, you know, what happened in generations past. Uh, but I think at least my generation and the younger generations were like, you know, if we fixate on things like that and we don't move forward, we're never going to make progress. So, you know, that's another thing we're, we're committed to here at This Is It is kind of breaking the mold of what was the gay bar, you know, in the last, uh, you know, 40, 50 years. 
um, and that's largely, you know, white owned, um, white staff, uh, and very, and, and, and even even art. If you if you look at it, um, and I guess I can say I'm old enough to remember, you know, how you know bars, and they still are to a certain degree. You know, this is a boys' bar. This is a girls' bar. This is a, a black bar. You know, this is a you know a bar for you know people of the transgender community, and you know, one thing that we try to do here is we try to, you know, not just blur the lines, but eliminate the lines. Um, and rolling all the way back to uh, June Brain, who we mentioned before, the, the founder of this bar, that was her mentality, even in 1968. Now, I'm not saying she was, you know, this monolith and, and the only person to have that mentality, but uh, I'll, I'll say it again. She really stuck her neck out there. She made sure that everyone who walked in this door, gay, straight, male, female, however you identified, um, was welcome here. And this became your, your second home. Now, did you have any um, kind of academic predisposition toward history or, or anything of that nature? Or was that just totally an aside that you well, ended up preserving think, a big part of history? I, th I think... Um, I don't want to say blame, but we can blame my father for that. Uh, my father, um, I think, instilled a, a passion for history, you know, not just from an educational standpoint, but uh, for the, uh, I guess, I guess to, to, to realize how, you know, if we're, if we're in this place where we are now, what, what brought us there? Or, or the sense of, you know, if you know what came before you, you're going to be better equipped when a similar situation, you know, arises, or even if a new situation arises, you can extrapolate um, by learning from the past. So I guess uh, at the core of uh, your question, yes, I love history. I have no academic background, uh, but uh, I think I was raised to appreciate history, and I've been able to apply that to many different areas of my life, and happily and thankfully, also to my work life here. So when I come in here every day, I, I mean, I, I know, like I said before, that I'm a custodian of a big piece of, uh, of queer history. And that sounds so much more like a historic preservationist than it sounds like a bar owner. Just the way oh. you phrase <laughs> that. It sounds like somebody, you know, that has gotten custody of some grand, uh, historic treasure, a house that, uh, maybe George Washington lived in, you know, a couple hundred years ago and is preserving that history. And it's great that you feel the same way about, you know, a, a bar, about a place that, that's been around, you know, 50, 60 years in, um, in Milwaukee, because that's the kind of attitude we need to be able to preserve our history and the stories of what happened in the gay community before we got to this current age of you know internet and social media yeah and, and i guarantee you i guarantee you art it's 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 an impulsion not a compulsion i mean it's something that i love and i'm passionate about um even with uh you know the knowledge that uh the greater community wants us to be preserved i do it uh you know for my own benefit as well as theirs um so it's it, it's very near and dear to my heart i, th I think you, you hit the nail on the head and Thank you. <laughs> You're quite welcome. So you first stumbled into that bar, give or take, 20 years ago uh, as a customer. And what was it like then? Was it was it thriving? Was it on the downslide? What was the crowd like? It was actually it was actually on the uptick. Um, in fact, I would say in the first uh, three to four years that I I came here. Now, first of all, they had. Uh, you know, Michael Takash, uh, who we mentioned before, had done an interview with June and, uh, you know, this this whole, like, I guess, say older millennial, um, you know, and spilling over into the generation prior has had rediscovered uh, this is it in a way. Um, at that point in time, retro was very in and we fit the, the bill to, to the T. Uh, we had, you know, we still have, we still have carpeting on the walls. We had um, these old Suida cash registers uh, <laughs> that, by the way, by the way, if the power went out, um, it, it, they still had the hand crank on the side. So you could, you could actually, uh, 
you could 10 bar with no power in here. Um, and that was always fun to, tr uh, to teach, uh, especially younger, uh, newer staff, uh, how to use these old, uh, uh, well, paperweights is really all they're good for now. But um, so that I, we were, business was kind of on the uptick uh, when I first started coming here. Um, so there was a whole new generation that was going for that, you know, grandpa's rec room, basement bar vibe. Um, almost, I, I want to say, and, and, and we might do in the, in the editing, you'll be like, oh, no, George, that, that, that date is off. But probably around the same time that that show Mad Men came out, where that, that uh, yearning back to that, uh, that 60s look and feel, maybe not, maybe not the culture, because there was a lot of things, uh, you know, misogynistic about that show. But um, yeah, we were on the uptick. The retro was in and, uh, and business wasn't booming, but was uh, increasing from what it was in the 90s. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I'm looking at the picture in the background there behind you, and you're talking about the vintage elements of the of the bar. Now, are you in the new section or the old section? I'm in I'm in the new section right now. So what you see behind me um, is actually, I mean, obviously our our logo, um, and that's uh, that sits above our stage. But uh, you can see also over here, you know, we have the the red carpeting on the wall, and even even some of it in the background. Uh, aside from where the logo is painted is, is black carpeting. Um, but the red carpeting is something that's always been on the wall. It's, uh, and, and I can, I can hopefully share with you some shots of the other side, but it's, it's that classic like, uh, wood paneling with, uh, carpet and even the bars in here, uh, you see that there are, are armrests where, uh, they're cushioned. A lot of places don't do that anymore. That was very seventies, uh, sixties, seventies. Yeah, I it's, can it's see just the a judges warm. paneling on the below the red carpet. I can see the judges paneling painted gold uh, on the lower half of the wall. So, oh, oh, yeah, I got to think opposite. And actually, I, I will say this paneling that you see there um, that we inherited uh, the the other the other side, the original side of the bar is more of a, a dark, uh, dark brown. Uh -huh. um, this uh, is more, more or less uh, some wainscoting that was left over from the previous tenants in this space. And we just uh, incorporated it into our design and, uh, and ran with it. It still has that vintage feel, though. It doesn't look like, you know, 21st century um, design. It looks like old school. What you would have expected might have been there in the, you know, in the 60s when it was open. Yeah. And, and like I said, we, it, it worked. So we, we kept it. Um, there were things, though, that when we did expand to this side, uh, we wanted to make 100% sure that we preserved. Um, and if you don't mind me sharing a little story with you, um, when June took over the bar in 1968, she, um, it, it was a bar prior. Um, and the name of the bar prior was called Vern's Tap. And that was here from 1939 until 1968 when, when she took over. And um, it had this old wood bar that was in here from, you know, from the 30s, late 30s, early 40s. And I believe she told me at one point in time that there was blue carpet everywhere. Um, so after, after the second or third year, I wanna say it was 1971, uh, June and her then business partner, Michael Latona, um, decided that they were going to redo the bar. And if you walk in here today, it's essentially, I mean, it's been resurfaced and, you know, re reupholstered, re, you know, touched up over the years, but it's essentially uh, the same bar that they put in in 1971. But the story I wanted to tell with you um, has to do when we ex with when we expanded. And uh, we had a, a gentleman by the name of John Stahl who would come in here and fix some of our upholstery and when he heard that we were doing construction, he said, hey, George, you know, when I was a little kid, my dad would build bars um, in different establishments in the city of Milwaukee. And he said, I remember coming in here with my dad in the early 70s and helping him install the, install the bar that's, uh, that's still here to this day. And that, that always, you know, it stuck with me throughout the construction process and our general contractor wanted to, you know, go through this company to, to do it, this contractor to do it. And ultimately I said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to make the offer to John because for me, it has more meaning for him to come. If he wants to build this new bar for us, um, 
And I think it, it just kind of closed this, uh, you know, 40, 50 year loop um, to have him come and do it. And that's ultimately what happened. He came in and, um, and built it. And I mean, by gosh, it looks exactly like the original bar. So that's just an, uh, an example of our commitment to keeping the feel, even though we could have done whatever we wanted in, in this space, we said, we're going to do as much as we can to uh, make that connection. Basically, basically art where we could have somebody who had never been here before they walk in and they wander from one side to the next and they wouldn't have a clue that, uh, you know, that this new half wasn't always here. That's pretty amazing. And we, and we were able to, um, cause we have a lot of stained glass. Um, I always call them like shaky's pizza style and that might even be too old of a reference now, but these shaky's pizza style stained glass lamps in here. And they're very specific. They're not uh, rainbow colored per se, more like primary colors, but they, they're rainbow esque. And uh, they were custom made um, in the early seventies. And I was able to get the, um, the artist's name off the, or the artisan's name rather, off of the inside of it and call around. And we found, we found the guy whose dad made them. And he doesn't, he doesn't do glass work, but he was able to recommend somebody to us. And we, we got those copied. I mean, it's, I mean, you can't even tell the difference between the old ones and the new ones. So um, just another uh, level of detail that we went when we expanded to preserving the, the nostalgia, the, the original vibe and feel of the bar. And that's particularly amazing because this is not your family. You know, if Joe no. had done this to honor his mother or whatever, you would kind of say, yeah, I could see why he would do that. But you're an outsider that came in. You've been an owner of the bar now for what, 12 years, roughly? Roughly 12 years, yeah. Um, and a patron of the bar for maybe 20. And yet you feel the same passionate commitment to the history of this bar that Joe would have felt or June would have felt, um, which is really an amazing thing when you, when you think about it. Now, as I said, you've had a roughly 20 year experience with this bar, but the bar itself has been around for 53 years. What do you think is the reason for that success? You know, so many bars have come and gone since then in your own neighborhood right there, you know, a mile away from you probably. Why is this is it still there? I think it's I think it has to do with what what I touched on before. Um, and that's, uh, you know, June setting the tone when when she first opened the doors here. And then when her son Joe came along, him, um, you know, drinking the same Kool-Aid and uh, making sure that everyone who walked in the door, regardless of your background, your economic status, the color of your skin, your gender, you name it felt as though that this was a safe, not just a safe place, but felt like this was a place where you, you were comfortable. It, it was, you know, we have a lot of the older customers that still call it the clubhouse. <laughs> and um, there's always kind of like a clubhouse feel, but it's not an exclusive feel. It's, you know, they, I often would, would, would answer this same question when people would pose me like, what, what is it that makes this is it, you know, you know, this way, that way. And, um, you know, in that same vein of, of you know, setting the tone of uh, inclusion and, and, and being welcoming, you can walk in here, it, it might be your first time, and, and, and soon we're, we're going to get you, we're going to get you to come here, Art. And I, I tell people, I guarantee you, um, after five, 10 minutes, you're going to sit down, you're going to have somebody who's just warm, welcoming, who talks to you, whether it's a bartender or another patron at the bar, and you're going to feel like you've been a regular here for years. So I guess to, to sum it all up, um, us being able to wrap our arms around not only the individuals in the community, but the, the trends of the community overall, I think that's what, that's what keeps this place going more, more than anything else. And you'll even come in here and if you come on a busy Friday, Saturday, you might say, well, oh, that's a lot of bartenders behind the bar, George. But um, part of our part of our MO is, you know, we want uh, we don't want people to just, you know, sling drinks, you know, sling and juice behind the bar, taking orders. We want your bartenders to be able to talk to you. Um, so, yeah, it might seem like, oh, yeah, we could do with one less bartender. 
but I'd rather spend the money to make sure that people are having a good time because that's, that's what, that's what brings people back. Um, more so than social media, more so than, you know, drink specials is the personal touch that you have with, with the people around you and the people who are serving you. So that's what we hang on to. And I, I truly believe that that's been the, the, the penultimate hallmark of our success over the years. Well, and it looks like you haven't really gone, you know, like so many bars do, they embrace the trend of the day. And, you know, this year, they're everything they're doing every day of the week is, um, you know, the bearded lady drag contest of the day. And the next year, it's something completely different. And they're constantly changing with the trends. And it kind of throws everything up in the air. People kind of don't build a relationship with it because they never know what to expect when they walk in. But it looks like you've kept pretty much to the, to the you know, the basics of the bar business for 50 plus years. And even though you mentioned that behind you, there is a stage with your logo on the wall, it's not a big stage. So no, you're probably not having fact, huge drag numbers there every night. Well, and the, the iteration of the stage, it's a, it's a modular stage. Right now, we only have uh, two pieces. Uh, uh, we can expand it uh, up to uh, eight by, well, we can expand it as much as we want, but usually it's an eight foot by 12 foot wide stage. So that comes up and down very easily. You know, we can open that up to, uh, you know, open up the dance floor then afterwards. But uh, I wanted to, you know, just piggyback off, off of what you said, you know, I'm, I'm always willing to try new things. I'm always willing to um, at least dip my toes into the trend of the day. But I think what happens often with, and it doesn't have to be a, you know, a gay bar or a queer establishment, but just with any kind of establishment that's socially oriented, that's socially based, is you can do too much of one thing. And um, I think you have to, you have to realize when that's happening and you need to make those adjustments when before it's too late. And I can I can say that, you know, with the introduction to drag here um, in the last, especially within the last four years, um, I think uh, we almost got into too much of it. And one of the things that our team is doing right now, our management team, is we're trying to find ways to to scale back so we can still give that, you know, just, oh, it's, we're going to a bar. There's no huge event. You know, we're just going to drink. We're going to have fun with friends. Um, so we're trying to find ways to scale back on, um, you know, too much of, of drag, too much of anything. And uh, without, without harming, like, the, the community of performers or taking away opportunities from them. So that is something that we follow and monitor a lot here. You know, do we have to adapt to the new times yes but we don't have to be a a, a one trick pony right. and um and I, I i don't know if there's any you know fledgling or or current you know business uh, owners out there are thinking about the bar scene but all my mentors um over the years uh, in this industry have told me the same thing they said don't become a one trick pony don't rely on you know, business just on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, our a mutual friend of ours um, had a saying, and uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but he would say, uh, "Georgie," and I won't do his voice because I will give away who it is. But he'd say, "Georgie, it's not about how you make a dollar and split it seven different ways." He would say, "It's how you make a dollar on seven different days." And he was full of all these uh, little quips and, and quotes like that, but. That sticks with me, and it's um, it's very true. You know, if um, if you're running a bar and you're only worried about uh, Friday and Saturday night, Sunday through Thursday, those those are the those are the days that uh, will keep you going. Friday and Saturday, at that point, will take care of themselves. Yeah, you might want to get a DJ. You might want to, you know, put a show on or host an event on Friday and Saturday. But when you build that core. Um, community base of or community customer base on Sunday through Thursday. That's what's going to keep a place going. And I made a promise. I made a promise to Joe when, uh, well, I mean, sadly, when he was on his on his deathbed, I, I told him, I said, Joe, you don't have anything to worry about. We're going to keep this place going for at least another 50 years. So um, I try to I try to adhere to those uh, those words of wisdom, those uh, 
that direction that I got from, from mentors like Jill, like our mutual friend, uh, I'll just say his name, Louie, who, who you know uh, had a couple of establishments in Atlanta um, back in the 80s. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to fall into those ruts and it's easy to do too much of one thing. So you got to find the balance and you have to make sure that you're taking care of people seven days a week, not just focusing on the, on the busy Fridays and Saturdays. Absolutely. And now speaking of adjusting to the times and, you know, making some, some changes and so on, that business for 40 plus years was a family operated business. Mm -hmm. You kind of came into it a little later and for the last 10 years or so, you've been, you've been an owner there, but you recently brought in somebody who is far from what I would consider um, mainstream gay society even far from mainstream drag society. Uh, you, have yeah, a, yeah. you have a partner there um, that um, most recently is known for making very extravagant changes to a Palm Springs, California hotel. Uh, yeah. Trixie Mattel. What was, how did that all evolve? How did Trixie become involved in a, in a small bar in Milwaukee? Well, I actually, I met Trixie here. Um, and uh, she will tell you, or, or you know, if you, depending if you see him in drag or out, uh, you know, Trixie or Brian will tell you that uh, this was their first gay bar experience. And uh, I had the pleasure of making one of their first drinks in a gay bar. Um, so we've we've known each other for the better part of you know a decade, if not if not slightly more, because even even though um, that's when we officially met here. Um, I used to be on the on the board for Pride Fest Milwaukee here, and I do think I remember um, a, a young Brian Furcus in a full um, Native American headdress uh, playing on on one of the stages at Pride when I was coordinating there. But yeah, the official meeting um, and our friendship began here. We've just been close over the years. When um, when Brian um, got booked as Trixie on RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, you know, he and I sat down and I said, look, this is a, a phenomenal opportunity for you. And uh, we, we weren't a performance venue at that point in time. And I said, look, you know, I'm trying to change, you know, how we, you know, I guess receive and present drag here. And I looked to his help and I guess that's really where our working relationship began. And uh, I said, you know, we're small. We can't afford a lot, but we want to we want to expand the horizons for this place. And uh, you know, I made the ask. I said, "Can we can we count on you to come and uh, and support us grow business here by doing some in person live viewings um, while your show is airing?" And we did. We set it up. Uh, they weren't here for one hundred percent of the episodes, but uh, I guess that's how our business relationship began after um you know being friends for several years and it just it just stuck around uh halloween here has been an annual tr tradition in fact we did get confirmation that uh, i guess news flash for anybody watching we did get confirmation that trixie is able to come back again we always do uh, a huge uh, costume party the thursday before um halloween and um yeah it's ju it just continued and continued and i would say about three years ago, just before the pandemic, um, which maybe we'll talk about some of that stuff uh, that we went through as well. But just before the pandemic, um, Trixie and I started having this real conversation where, look, George, you know, I've, I've always loved, you know, this is it. And, uh, and I'll backpedal here real quick. It, you mentioned to me that it, it's amazing that, uh, you know, me with no family connection. I think that's why Trixie and I mesh so well together is we both have that passion for the history um but yeah about about three years ago we had that serious conver conversation about uh you know her wanting to expand her income base kind of like a kind of like a dancer has a you know a shelf life so to speak where they can only dance for so long Trixie's thinking to herself well I'm not gonna be doing death drops on stage and you know being able to travel the country travel the country all my life doing this and uh, she wanted to make an investment in, in not only this place, but in her hometown. Um, 
celebrating her roots, celebrating all of the good memories that, that she and I and everyone else have had here over the years. So that came to fruition um, just, just actually coming out uh, when the restrictions started to lift from COVID-19. Um, that's when we made the, the big announcement. But really, it's been a, I guess it's been a, a, a six, maybe seven year slow progression, you know, towards, uh, towards Brian becoming part of the, the ownership here. And I'm assuming that um, Brian did not try to paint the bar pink and orange with hearts and flowers everywhere. Oh, uh, absolutely not. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> in, fact, in fact, like I said, we, we both understand we have the same appreciation, depth of appreciation for, for the history of, of the space down to the most minute detail. Um, and it's a struggle for us, um, you know, over the years when I've had to change one little thing in here, um, you know, it's, it's always a struggle because we don't, we want to keep the place alive. We want to um, lay the foundation for a whole, uh, a, a whole new generation to experience this place. But it's, it's hard when you have to make those changes, but um, absolutely no, uh, this is not going to become, you know, bubblegum pink everywhere in here. Um, Trixie has the same appreciation for the for the history, the feel, the vibe, and nostalgia that I do, and the rest of our customers do. Well, I am glad that both of you have taken on this challenge and have taken something that is already iconic in Milwaukee, uh, and I believe it's also the longest continuously operating gay bar in the entire state of Wisconsin. I don't think there's another one that's been around longer. In the entire state, for sure. Um, Michael Takash and I, again, uh, kind of the preeminent, uh, I would consider him the preeminent uh, historian of Milwaukee, uh, well, the Milwaukee LGBTQ community. Um, we've, we've done a lot of uh, independent uh, research, you know, noodling about trying to find another uh, gay bar queer establishment that has been continuously operating in the same place under the same you know name um, in the Midwest. Even in Chicago, Art, there's there's a couple. Um, I, I think Little Jim's finally did close. They did uh, you, a couple years ago. Um, maybe Second Story Bar in Chicago um, might come close, but you have to realize that the majority of, and uh, granted, we're only one year here. We're 1968, which is one year pre Stonewall. Uh -huh. But um, the majority of, of bars that have had longevity, and they are they are getting fewer and far between. But the mo majority of them are post Stonewall, right? Um, you know, because that did open. I mean, literally open uh, and figuratively open doors uh, for a lot of the queer establishments out there. But there, to, to my knowledge, you may be the most comprehensive uh, study of of gay bars, queer bars that's been done to date. And so by the time you get, uh, you know, the whole gay bar archives, you know, everything's compiled. Um, I hope you write a book because <laughs> nobody, nobody's done a comprehensive study of it. But um, yeah, I, we are we we can for sure say that we're the oldest in Wisconsin, um, about 99 percent sure that we're the the oldest continually operating bar in the Midwest. And uh, we're definitely, if we're not in the top 10, we're pretty close in, uh, in the top 20, probably in the country. And uh, well, you know, even as well as I do that, I mean, Stonewall, let, let's go back to that, um, for being such an institution and a historical landmark, um, I think you're aware, like I'm aware that Stonewall closed very shortly after yes. um, the actual riots. And I don't think uh, it was resurrected until the 80s under the first iteration. And then it was, I, I don't know exactly the history, but. You're absolutely right. It opened um, after, after the Stonewall uprising. It closed, I think, in 1970 or 71 um, and remained closed for like 20 years it operated as other things like a Chinese restaurant and whatever, but it was not a gay bar. Um, and I believe it was in the eighties, the mid to late eighties when it was reopened as new Jimmy's. Okay. Uh, you and know what? Eventually, I have heard this. I have heard this. Yeah. 
It was called New Jimmy's at Stonewall Square or something like that. And then the owners of New Jimmy's, uh, a couple of years in, through pressure from local people, decided to revert to the Stonewall name. So all these people who think that Stonewall has been open since 1968, I think it's when they originally opened, or 67, yeah. um, that they've been open continuously for 50 plus years is absolutely mistaken. I mean, oh, but, but we don't want to take away from it because, like I said, it is a significant, um, you know, institution right. and uh, from both from both like a, a cultural and historical standpoint, um, it's definitely significant. But I guess I was just bringing that up uh, just to, you know, I guess, emphasize that there's there's a lot of uh, mythos out there, a lot of, uh, you know, unclear history. And that, I, I guess that speaks to the fact that until recently with uh, people like you doing the Gay Archives Project and other people like Michael Takash and scores of other people around the country, we're starting now in the last 20, 30 years to compile our queer history in a concise matter that's never been done before. Um, so I, I, I really do, I really do hope that, you know, this, this project, you know, comes together and the, the net result is like the, the comprehensive study we've all been waiting for on queer bars and establishments in this country, okay. because there, there is some ambiguity. Um, even, uh, you know, we mentioned Stonewall, but even uh, are, you're familiar with Lafitte's in exile. Uh huh. The but they're not in the same original location. Exactly. And that's why, you know, it, 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 that's why they're called in exile right. because they were shut down and then moved. And guess what? In their new location, they've been there since 1968, too. So, you know, a lot of times they're called the oldest gay bar in the country still operating. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, we're over here, too. Yeah. But it's, it's not it's not really a competition. It's just, uh, you know, we need to we need to make sure that our spaces um, that have been around that have, um, you know, such a rich and deep history are highlighted. And we don't forget about that. Well, absolutely. You know, something could something could happen here tomorrow. You know, we could, uh, I mean, heaven forbid, look what happened, you know, the last two years. You never know what's going to happen. And uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're celebrating it now, um, celebrating it in a way that uh, indoctrinates, in, um, inspires a, a whole other generation. And it's, you know, preserved, uh, the, the actual history is preserved for posterity as well. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, like he said, it's not a competition. Um, just like with you, you know, you're preserving a piece of history. You're not trying to compete with every other bar in, in Milwaukee to be the most historically preserved or anything. You're not looking for any titles there. It's a matter of trying to keep the history around so people after we're gone will still know about it. And that's why I have worked so hard to connect with people like Don Schwamb and Michael Takash. Um, I was just having a conversation. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but there's two historians uh, that have focused largely on Chicago by the name of uh, Rick Carlin and uh, St. Suki Delacroix. I know St. Suki, but yeah. They have a book coming out uh, in the fall that is, um, it's called Last Call Chicago. And it's about 1,001 LGBTQ friendly spaces that have existed in Chicago over history, a thousand and one in one city. It's hard to believe, but that's it's true. But, and you know, Milwaukee here are I don't think we can come close to a thousand and one. But I mean, just to put it in perspective, I, there's seven, maybe eight, if my math is correct, um, uh, bars bars specifically that identify as queer um, LGBTQ. Um, right now, when I first started uh, coming out to the bar scene, I think there were 22 in Milwaukee. And yeah. Milwaukee is like, you know, this little, you know, it, Milwaukee, I often describe as Chicago's younger sister, but at least the, you know, the fun one that you want to drink with. Um, but uh, I mean, we're tiny compared to, you know, Chicago. So the fact that we used to have um, less than, you know, 20 years ago, we used to have you know, 20 plus, um, you know, queer establishments here serving our community is really kind of mind boggling. So I'm glad that they're doing that in Chicago, that you're doing that here, and that other people are taking an interest in, in that queer history, whether it's, whether it's just the, the you know, the, the queer bar history, 
or just our, our community history overall. It's, it's so incredibly important, Absolutely. Um, especially, especially in this day and age where, you know, where we are so used to now with technology where everything's on our, at our fingertips and there's another, you know, news story that's going to distract us the, the next day. In fact, um, trying to think what uh, Gore Vidal said at one point in time, uh, I think he, something to the effect that we live in the United States of amnesia. We can't remember. <laughs> we can't remember what happened last Tuesday, much much less what happened two years ago. And so that's why it's so important to uh, not only have conversations like these, but uh, to document it and uh, you know create an archive as you are um, for future generations as well. And I, I invite anybody who's interested in exploring the history of uh, the gay community to go to my website on gaybarchives.com, I have a page that is called Archives. And on that page, I list some international LGBT archives, some US national archives, and then broken down by state, as many archival websites as I could find for the gay community, many times affiliated with state or um, regional institutions, universities, colleges, things of that nature, academic in, in nature. But you can go down that list and you can find hundreds of websites that document the history of different parts of our community, which I had not been able to, I did it for my own benefit because I was constantly, when somebody would mention a gay bar in Cleveland and I'm like, oh, what was the name of that archive where I was looking at Cleveland stuff? So I made the list for myself to assist in my research but it's on my website, anybody can use it. So if you're curious about uh, Kansas City gay history, you can find the website on there for Kansas City, I think it's Glamour, uh, Gay and Lesbian Archives of the Midwest. But you can go in there and find that kind of information. And um, that's why I'm happy to work with people like Michael and Rick Carlin and you know other people who are historians and archivists um, because I, no one person can do it by themselves. And by doing it collectively and, and supporting each other, we're helping get the, you know, the big picture out there. I would also invite you or whoever handles your social media stuff for, um, for the bar to use the Gabe Archives group that I established. It's a little over a year old, and we have about 5,500 members uh, who have daily conversations about their memories of gay bar history. And you're welcome to post whatever you want about the This Is It bar history, old pictures, drag queen that performed there in 1981, um, whatever you feel like posting in there, uh, because that's what that whole group is about. It's about talking about the history we remember. And, you know, sometimes for me, because I'm a little older, I lose sight of the fact that to some people, 2006 is the beginning of their gay history, you know. It's hard to grapple with that, right? The the older that we uh, all get, but uh, you know, I think I think you take the right approach, though, and and I think this is where you're going. That uh, they need to be informed of, uh, you know, there there is there is stuff that happened before 2006, and I think it establishes a better foundation for their experience in the in the gay community moving forward. You know, like like I said, was instilled, uh, you know, in me at an early age knowing where you came from, how we got here, um, kind of uh, lays the foundation, builds a framework for the, the rest of your life. I, I was going to say success, but no, it's, it's all aspects of your life. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share some of these stories with us and to tell us about your passion for Milwaukee's history, uh, gay history, as well as the history of your very own bar, This Is It. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And you know what? If I look distracted just then, I actually have the, the bar's general manager, uh, Pika, here, who is my dog. So she's been uh, whining. Probably I haven't been giving her enough attention, Art. But uh, Does she need to get a little bit of airtime? Do we need uh, to you know, I, to her? Pika, do you want to go on camera? Come on, come on. Up, up, up. Come here. Up, up. I don't know if we're going to be able to see her, but we're going to try. We're going to try. Oh, no. She's being camera shy. Oh, well. But... You can find her on Instagram. I will. I'll find a picture of her and post her up there for everybody to see. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it was great talking with you today, Art. And um, I know um, 
even leading up to this, you know, we've, we've been able to connect and I, I'm just glad that I'm glad that there are people like you out there who appreciate, uh, you know, the history of our community just as much as I do. And I think what you're doing is great. So everyone listening, please, please subscribe to uh, Gape Archives, follow it, contribute. I know I'm going to be given that link. Uh, you told me about our, to our customers, because there are some stories that I think uh, uh, we definitely all uh, need to get out there. And I think people will bring a smile to people's face. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes another episode of the Gabe Archive Show. For more information about this episode or to find more episodes, visit gabearchives.com.